this is a presentation about my thesis. Uh, roots in agricultural value chains. This picture is taken by Aulia. This is a copy vine with the different ripening stages of coffee berries. That's not really nice for an introduction. So, what I will explain to you is um, first I will give you an introduction what my actual thesis assignment is to inform you. Uh, afterwards, I would like to break down the basics of how a coffee or cocoa chain looks like, a cocoa chain. And afterwards, I will explain the basic terminology of what is a traceability system or what does track tracing actually mean. And afterwards, I will go into detail about the two my main modes of traceability I dealt with in my uh, report, which is process and product traceability. Afterwards, I will explain briefly um, more about flow functionality. And I combine this a bit with other apps available, so you can see the differences between what is already available and what flow already can do. And afterwards, I give a short recommendation. Long version of this all will, of course, be my course. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, I try to stick it to uh, half an hour, maybe less, maybe more, depends on how many questions you have. And please interrupt me whenever you'd like to. <laughs> um, just a question Is Thomas looking at via that screen? Mm -hmm. Thomas, seeing you, can you see I'm fine. You fine? Okay, good. Yes. Okay, so I'm just You can't see the screen from here, therefore, I don't. Oh, okay. Can you? Okay. This is a bit of the formal definition of my main question. It's a mouthful of words. <laughs> so I can break this down for you. My main question is about what are the main features and functionalities that AquaFlow needs to have to be an effective track and trace and certification management tool for development and to be and to improve information transparency at small level or uh, small department level in coffee and cocoa value chains. Well, it's a long phrase, but what it, for me it means actually that the, the this problem or this statement has three people or three main organizations involved, which is ACFO, which would like to develop flow further into to venture into the agricultural sector, which is um, relatively new. Next to that, we have UTS certified, which is a certification standard. They are in the business of getting farmers more sustainable and to develop the sustainable development goals and to support the sector in this, how to get companies involved into certification. And next to that, we have the partnership with SMG, who support, which is the NGO that supports and ACFO and uh, food certified. So, so we can break this down into what do we need for flow itself, what do we need for certification standard, and s and is part of the partnership. And I, as I said, I will share the presentation and put it online. Um, so first, I'd like to give you a sort of a crash course. What is a supply chain, <laughs> and how should we actually review um, uh, what is our main focus in this? Because when you look at this, you see that we have the producers, I put them here on top, sometimes they're in the other place, but we have the producers which cultivate all the cocoa, and then you have a few traders actually, <laughs> before you end up at the trader for export. Then you have all the cocoa beans bulked, rebagged, and put into the container uh, and shipped off to a factory which further processes the cocoa beans into three main products, which is cocoa liquor, cocoa butter, and cocoa powder. So what actually happens is that the beans are pressed, and then you can extract the fat from it, which is the cocoa butter, and the other residues that you have, that's cocoa powder, and there are some other side products. Um, and in cocoa, there are, for example, in this example, there are two manufacturing stages, and first is the basic processing, and the second is when you actually produce your chocolate bars which go to the supermarket or when it goes for example to cosmetics or other kinds of uh, and 
usage. But uh, our project mainly focuses on this first part in here, and this is also called the first mile. Some businesses will call this the last mile to make it more easy for you, because they see it as, oh, we this last thing we need to digitize, but Food Certified prefers to see this as, no, this is the first step in our chain, and this is our first focus. So they call this the first mile. So I'll stick to that. <laughs> um, so when you have this first mile, you're only seeing the producer and trader, but it's much more than just one producer and one trader. To connect the supply chain or this value chain, is a, there are many actors uh, working in the Asian in coffee and cocoa sector. This is Sulawesi, um, a picture of the island, which is more north. Um, when you have to think about cocoa trade or cocoa cultivation, there are here in this area, there are farmers every week, they're like harvesting some of their beans, and somebody's collecting this regionally in the village. And afterwards, this is packed onto the truck, and then it's transported on the first part, and then here it's called this palu, it's the first export harbor in Sulawesi, and then afterwards, if it's not traded via Palu further, or when it's just first processed in Palu, then it will go to Moscow. So we Dutch are used to getting our bike and being in the supermarket in 10 minutes, but this is 250 kilometers, and this is 650 kilometers. Now, and then you have uh, many mountains and slopes and hills, you have poor roads, and it's a remote region. This is, well, technically the region is the focus on. And, and this is not just uh, one collector, and then there are some ballsy <laughs> truck drivers that will go on one go to Mastercard if they've organized their chain. But usually this goes by three, four, or five people before it actually ends up here. There are many middlemen in this process before it actually ends up at the exporter. And this is all not, not really digitized. So I have a classmate, and he is actually Coco. Uh, uh, source uh, sourcing manager. He works at the Dutch uh, organic trading company, and he gave me his uh, thesis report. And I saw this picture, and I figured, okay, so uh, this picture is a cocoa bag in Tanzania. <laughs> um, he was researching different quality levels and grades in cocoa, and here you have actually a first example of how. Uh, Track and tracing can be administered. So you have here the label, which is green. That means that it's organic. You have the, the key KY here. That means it's from Kela. And then you have the buying post, the agents, the badge, and the lot number, which is all. What is the problem, or what? What could, be, what could be issues when you label it like this? Because it, it has a track and trace system, but what, what could be possible <coughs> issues when you are labeling it like this? Do you have any other That can get wet. We can't read it anymore. Yeah. You can write anything. <laughs> Indeed. Is it really organic? Because my <laughs> agent might say it's organic, like, oh, they're so good. <laughs> but if you don't know this buying agents, well, how do you know? And uh, what is happening in the field, you don't know either. You don't know if child labor is used. You, don't, you cannot link the processes from the fields to the actual product. And <coughs> while actually tracking this product, like it's arriving out of the warehouse, and go to the next step, and the next step in the chain, that's called uh, tracking. It's like your DHL package. You uh, you get a number from VHL saying, well, if you want to check the package, please click this link, and then you can file your number, and then you can see which warehouse or which posting station your package is. That's not tracking. It's done the same with other types of products, like Coffee and Coco. You can track where your bag uses and where it's going. Tracing is a bit different to the uh, harder to explain. Uh, for this, I use the example of the deadly cucumber. <laughs> so um, it's actually quite a horrible story because 
there was a food scandal in Germany where people died of eating hamburgers. And after dismantling the whole hamburger and figuring out where the problem is, they found out that the cucumber was the main problem. And they sourced it back first to the Netherlands, but after much more research into the administrative system, they found out that this cucumber was coming from Egypt. And that in Egypt, somebody, well, sorry to say it like this, but somebody took a dump on the field and then it ended up, the bacteria ended up in the cucumber. And, well, then you have suddenly have a deadly cucumber. So, two things. Cucumbers can be deadly, apparently. Second is that supply chains have become so increasingly complex, people started to get worried about uh, where is our product coming from. It can be reviewed this later on if something happens. And that's called tracing. So, um, the paper trail is when you're looking into all the administrative systems in order to trace your product back to, this, to its origin. And that's why this project, is, that's called, also called a paper trail, and we're looking into digitizing the paper trail so you can get better information exchange about this. Who certified calls the, the Product traceability is a chain of custody because it's a chain and you try to verify each step of the chain if you're really linking everything up. The other thing that we just briefly touched upon is what is actually happening in the field. And that's called process traceability. So process traceability is linked to the influence from the natural environment. But it's also based on good agricultural practices. And for me, that this has a human component. I think it's a bit lacking in the statement. But it's what is happening with the product in the field. Uh, Uts calls this the code of conduct. And in other words, the code. So sorry for you IT guys. They don't make it easier for you with the lingo here. So the code of conduct is really based on what is happening in the field. So first, I would like to go into this process of what is happening in the field, what is going on. So, um, again, I have the chain for you here. Um, to explain what is going on in the field, it's also important to start with what we are doing now. We are trying to digitize the certification standard for goods. And this is the code of conduct that currently is being digitized in Indonesia. So what the code of conduct actually was in the previous setting is that we had food certified here as an external actor and this is the trade chain from farmers groups to trade to export import and further on. This is the good inside portal but I will explain in the next slide. Um, so what actually UTS does they have the certification standard but in Indonesia, you have farmers groups of 10 to 15 farmers, which cultivate one or two hectares, maybe. And you have many of these small groups. And they're not as well organized as in Vietnam, for example. And the problem with that is that if you have a small farm group, they cannot afford the certification standards. It's too expensive. These people are trained and need another body to actually verify if your certification is implemented. So that's why you have a certificate holder. This is most likely the exporter or trader, depending on the supply chain, that holds the certificate for the farmers. And this certificate holder is also the one who is the end responsible person in order to get these farmers certified to implement some kind of food system, some kind of quality system, so you don't get the cucumbers. Um, um, so what's certified is researches the administrative system at the export, the certificate holder, and they train farmers in order to have better farming in the future. But OOTS cannot be their own judge. They cannot say, oh, we're so good, <laughs> we're so sustainable. No, they need a, a third party or a judge or somebody else to actually verify this, and this is a certification body. body. It's a third party auditor which sends in auditors into the field once a year to check if all the rules and guidelines are according to the wood standard. And for a certification standard, this must be done every year. So it means that our auditors are every year, or they visit the field, they check all the rules, they go to the next field to check all the rules, and they build up a whole report if a farmer is compliant or non-compliant. 
split the second polynomial. <coughs> so we know the basics of why digitization is helpful for the sector at ACO. We have the intuitions, like information is locked away in cabinets. The report of the auditor is digitally transferred, but it takes a long time. He needs to write this out after he's done the audit. Um, the first administration to create a quality system at farmers, to create the first pathways of, okay, what do we need to change? That's not digitized either, it's all paper. So you're really, I've seen people trying to get certified for <coughs> three certification standards, dragging around such pieces of paper to just the first initial farmers field, 10 farmers. And then you have to separate both camera and GPS location, etc., etc. <coughs> What is specific for agriculture is that I've seen here also in the Netherlands that uh, organic farmers, they just quickly draw a map and they indicate what their crop rotation is. So for example, in this field they have uh, broccoli, but next year they have potatoes and the year afterwards they have something else, so that the soil keeps is healthy. And this that drawing on paper also needs to be done for certification standards. They would like to have an indication. But yeah, it's not, you cannot interact with just an indication in um, paper. Next to that, I've heard from food staff that they go into the field for three months, but they absolutely don't have time to digitize everything into Excel sheets and get difficult about it. So they need to be on their next trip soon later on because their time's already very valuable and expensive. Um, yeah, then there is that the administration to start this whole internal management of farmers, that you manage each farmer group and that you have an appointed lead farmer and that there's this whole administrative base. It's very time consuming and coffee and cocoa have very low margins. It's a commodity, it's not a, it's not gold. <laughs> so, uh, and depending on what coffee or cocoa you're dealing with, we're thinking about log production, how to get this digitized. And then this, is, this gets really expensive. And the auditors themselves, they are need to be trained in a specific field, specific trained on the multiple standards. So they need to well, rainforest line, trade organic foods. They need to know all these standards. And it takes some time and training before you actually get to be an auditor. You need to get a lot of uh, certificates yourself. So auditors, auditors so when we're trying to apply flow, we get a new, uh, we get an improved um, uh, circulation of information. Because when you give OOT certified, in this example, now we are giving OOT certified the first tryout for the tool, then they go into the field, they can digitize whatever they've done, they can review if farmers had their training, they can look into their they can digitize all the critical control points for the certification standards, which is actually the rules, <laughs> and answer those rules. And when Oots gets back to the to their office, they can send this up to Amsterdam here, to the headquarters. They can send the some of these things that they've reviewed themselves already to the certification body, because there are in total 118 rules you need to apply, comply to. And about 50 to 60 are researched at this moment of the most important ones because otherwise you have unmanageable survey duration. <laughs> it will take very long. <clears throat> um, so the benefit of this is that you can exchange information much quicker. And then this part you can beforehand review what they will find in the field and what they need to focus on. The trader has more information about their farmers and they can look into their investments, like where what farmers we need to invest, which are the problematic ones. They have far more easy access if they are doing it uh, digitally. And the uh, long term perspective is that the lead farmer from each group has their own smartphone so they can collect the data themselves. And then it puts also the pressure of the certified in the local office because. Well, they assume that more farmers will get involved into the program, and then uh, information starts to pile up. So um, now we also have the 
the thing is that it's not only here and here and there. Here is the good inside portal of the gym. <laughs> and the GIP is made for trainers, for exports importers, to actually offer their cacao, but also it's a it's a buying and sale sales portal. So all sustainably certified cocoa enters the portal and is being exchanged here, and then it goes up to the manufacturer. The problem with, or problem, the 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 main uh, the idealistic idea here is to actually extend this to here that farmers can offer their produce, or, or that at least you can link up the information from the farmers into this portal. So you know not only what grade of cocoa you have, but also what happens in the field with regard to sustainability goals. You don't have to rely on the sticker of the main goods only. You can really review data. That's what is really interesting also for traders. If they want to report to their end clients, like, yeah, we have these and these specific goals we've executed. So, yeah, so a few benefits, digitizing the code of conduct. Information is uploaded and away. Uh, it can be shared with other parties involved. You can look into the non-conformities of the farmers if you can visualize this on the map. So you can give indicators to which farmers are a bit more riskier with regards to oh they don't they don't uh, they probably need some help with, to get more sustainable or to get better production or to get more input. And the main point, of course, is reducing the auditing costs. That's the main selling point because uh, it's all about these margins which is really a time of assets and they have very small margins here. Um, yeah so most of the flow issues were already quite ready. I've, I've uh, called with other people from the sector and uh, had interviews with experts and they say yeah flow we really like it. You can data drop it. There's easy exchange. It's very user friendly. Only uh, a few minor points of improvement were that, which were already taken up, taken up in the last few months with regards to the S and partnership. That it's very easy to already make libraries of surveys or to actually have the code comments from each digitized, so you can use it also in other contexts. Because if you have the same survey for different countries, depending on commodities, then you can, uh, Amsterdam will be at some point be able to aggregate data and to do research. So it's really interesting to have libraries, so they, if you standardize it, you can include research for it as a whole as well. Um, some minor thing about uh, what somebody mentioned in your during meeting was that an auditor, certification auditor, needs to see time and location in the photos, because they don't need survey time, but they need the photo moment. And we recently changed the name I heard. <laughs> and there's like three times data approval. You have the farmers which do in the data, you have the trader, you have food certified, and then you have finally the certification body that really gives the 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 food certification itself. So when it comes to these processes in fields and I haven't talked about agricultural specific things yet. <laughs> um, but uh, from another interview, I've uh, Charlotte and I got a really nice overview on what the sector needs are, and I found this as well in other people I've spoken with, is that there is really a need for to be able to analyze if volumes are increasing or not and to give farmers some kind of a risk profile, which is not only related if you're certified or not, but even in investments, like is the farmer using their inputs properly, are they properly spraying, properly fertilizing. Um, and these investments per farmer, they really would like to check, track, so it's just even a financial investment as well. Uh, the traders are really interested, interested in yield predictions, because what happens is that the farmer certified and they think, oh cool, let's increase the volume, I buy from the neighbor and I sell it as certified and then I get more money for the certification. So <laughs> to prevent this, Good idea, yeah. Yeah, lot, lot. to prevent <laughs> this, you really want to have a basic yield prediction so that you know what the geo shape is, so you can measure the hectares and then afterwards combine this with the data you have from 
previous years or from what is actually possible. You have this number of trees there in that state, and then it should give so much volume. That's really a big need in this sector. <laughs> um, yeah, you want to, uh, what I know from traders is they visit maybe once a year, maybe once a year, two years to visit the they visit the field. Uh, from the Netherlands, for example, if you're an organic trading company, you visit once and then go back. Or the coffee company, they just go to their suppliers, say hi, and go back. But they would like to have more updates in the year. So then, flow is excellent. You can just pop, upload it into the dashboard, and then you can review it from a distance. And you can in inform your customers and yeah, review your own investments. As <coughs> for research, there is a possibility. Well, the thing is, many in the people in the field are discussing, is certification not too expensive? Uh, uh, is it working? Are, are these sustainability goals actually implemented? In this research, there is a big gap in the different... For, co for coffee, there's more research. For cocoa, there's less research, and it's not really... It's The research needs to pile up more. And by using... No, you can compare certified groups and non-certified groups for a research purpose. For example, Wageningen University and their development department would be really interested in this, where if somebody can compare trade management, they would like to, or sustainable value chains, I'm sorry, <laughs> they would like to get into, they would like to, to do research in this field. So and then this can be very useful as well. Um, yeah, you can see if training worked at farm's level. So you train them, you say prune your trees, and then afterwards you can see if they prune the trees properly and that sort of thing. And another one that is actually for later on is that you can review if farmers are involved with in Sulawesi, there this year, this year were big forest fires. If you can actually compare the geoshape data to another map, then you can see if farmers were in the same region as the forest fires and do further research into this topic. But I will explain a bit more about later. So, now we have the whole process. What is up to the farmer? Now we move to the chain. Where is this bag of cocoa beans actually going? And where do, why do we need to follow? So, this is an example from a GeoCertify. They use QR codes in Ethiopia for to the main reason to be able to distinct, to pay farmers, to reward farmers for their quality. So if they have this, so the ideal situation is that you have farmers, you have their information, you link this to the back, and you know what the quality of the cocoa is, but you can also give the farmer the finance for that, because that doesn't always happen. They just started with this in Ethiopia, which is a big coffee country. So, um, this is related to this bag. That's called identity preservation. So you really know what, not only the quality in the grave, but you also know which farmer uh, is linked to this. You know what he has done in his field, and you have some background information about this. When you look into further, well, because some companies have such large volumes, they cannot keep track of all of this. And they have a separate line in their warehousing that you have a conventional and and a sustainable line of cocoa or coffee, and this is called segregation. So you segregate the, you at least know what is certified and what is not certified. And they keep this all separate because you cannot have cross contamination, otherwise, your produce is not certified. Mass balance is a bit difficult to explain, but um, for example, I explained to you before if you press the To go all these you don't you you if you have for example half of it is certified if you go go and your other half is not certified you mix this and you press this into cocoa butter or cocoa powder you can call you can mass balance it so if you have uh, 100 kilos of one and 100 kilos of the other you mix it press it and then you have the two separate ones from different origins, you can still say, okay, this half is certified and this half isn't. Otherwise, you get 
problems with your processing. It's really, uh, for coffee, except for example, you can still distinguish this, this but for cocoa, you're, at some point, you're combining this all into one machine, and then it's hard to separate everything. Um, and the problem claim is mainly to do with palm oil, because palm oil really gets just one, one machine, and then you have oil in the end. <laughs> and, uh, that's, I didn't look further into this, but this, this, these kind of uh, indicators, it's important to know beforehand what does your aqua partner or your customer, what do they want? Do they really want to have this identity preservation, like in next door here in the coffee company? Do they really want relationships with the farmers? But what if you're bigger or even like now efforts or even a bigger company? Then what level of traceability would you like to have, and what line, and what what is your partner's needs? Um, so it's not only about the different modes of traceability, but also different levels, like how deep you want to go. Um, <clears throat> some of the basic tools while here we have pictures of QR code. Uh, next to that there are barcodes, which are which are often used in the in the in trade chains, in agricultural trade trade chains. They implement barcodes as well at smaller level. Uh, QR codes are relatively to you. I, I don't know exactly how the uh, technical system works behind it, but they're trying to figure this out. And next to that, we have a little bit less known uh, technical solution, which is an RFID tag. Maybe you've seen this RFID tag on the inside from uh, if you're, for example, buying something in the store. And then you're walking out of the store, and the gates suddenly start to beep, and it's oh shoot, I forgot to dismantle your tag or to read the tag out, so you can just walk through the gates. And this is this this is called an RFID tag. We have several kinds of RFID tags. It's really technical if I go into the details, but um, the main importance is that uh, barcodes you scan and you have a number on your screen. So you know this number is linked to a number in your database, and there you know what the what 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 it means. But you don't know it by just looking at the number. You really need data separate database in order to know what what the product specifications are. RFID you can insert in information as well. So the main difference is that you can, for example, have farmers' information on the flow survey and somewhere in the near future, depending on what our ID using radio waves. <laughs> and that's the main beauty of RFID. It's not yet used, as far as I know, because the margins for the coffee and the cocoa are so small, and they even try it in the meat sector and some other you know, Dutch uh, branch organizations, but the price of the tag is still too expensive. And that's why it gets hard to implement this at this stage. But to give you a theoretical case of implementing an RFID tag, for example, we have this chip, and you seal it in some kind of box that nobody can open, and you can read it out with a radio, using radio waves. Well, for example, if you're a farmer, you need to prepare the, the coffee bags beforehand by sewing it in or applying the tag somewhere, and the farmer can then or the regional collector can uh, fill the bags from the region or per farmer, and then you have an RFID attached to every bag. And then you put it on the truck for transport, and then when you're entering the warehouse, it can read out the tags. Um, there are tags which you need to do up, which you need to read out up close, but there are also tags you can read out from 10 meters apart, so that's a benefit. You don't need to scan every barcode. Um, but then further warehousing happens, and then it gets really hard to have this identity preservation. So implementing an RFID tag is not the only the technical aspect of it. It's really the food quality management aspect, or actually managing the, the tags. Because what happens here is that there usually, when this not, is not a very organized chain, you have three people already in truck transport. When your beans get moist or you have a problem, you open the bag, you lay out the beans somewhere for, to dry, and then you mix three or four bags. 
and then you put beans back into the sack, and then you already have the uh, loss of the information because all the three different farmers, four farmers, are uh, their information is combined, and the tag does not say what's actually happened in the field. The same counts for actually that the farmer has this back beans. It's loaded on the truck. And another problem is that on the road, these beans will be traded here and there. As long as the cooperative or the farm or the, the truck driver keeps this quota, he will have he will trade here and there some extra on the road. And that makes it hard because if you have invested in a very expensive, relatively expensive RFID tech and it's traded on the way, <laughs> you lose your RFID tech, you lose your investment. And that's why it's it's not the technical part only, it's the practical limitations of it. And that's why uh, careful consideration needs to be taken for before implementing a technical system. And it's already uh, an, uh, innovative if somebody starts implementing barcodes, because if you lose barcode, yeah, okay, you lost barcode. <laughs> um, so that's why the product traceability is a more of a long-term uh, uh, long goal with certified as well because it takes more management and more care before you implement such a thing. So, a quick overview. Pros, it's often used in supply chains. You have geolocation numbers and barcodes. So that it's barcodes which are specifically arranged according to a region, so you can read barcode, but somehow, like French telephone numbers or Dutch telephone land numbers, that you can see, oh, that's that region because uh, number 003 called me, that's something like this. Um, you can do basic product traceability. Um, if the barcode itself is damaged, you can always type the number into the flow system or whatever the barcode system you have, and it's affordable. Um, the downside of this is there are no unique numbers, so there are barcodes are generalized, generalized numbers. The information is stored only externally in the database, and external barcode scanners are needed if you quickly need to scan all the barcodes from the ballots, because if you need to do that with a smartphone only, it might not work or it takes a lot of time, and you really need to incorporate this in the work process. It needs to be done quickly because the next time truck will arrive, and then that sort of thinking you need to be in. And every, every barcode can scan in. For RFID, the tag is already, the information is in the tag and it can be uploaded immediately. You can, depending on what tag you have, you can read it out for, from 10 meter distance. And because of this unique sequence of numbers, there is talk about the blockchain. But if I need to explain the blockchain, I need another presentation. So I'm <laughs> going to leave it there for you to review on your um, Yeah, the downside. RFID, if you RFID is traded on to another partner, or if it's broken, then your whole information is lost. So you need to calculate in, okay, this number of RFID decks, I won't be able to read out. Um, it's not yet used at smaller levels, so we really need to have a trial and error phase before we can successfully implement this. It's expensive, and yeah, it's the difficulty with all the really setting up such a system for a supply chain that is also a problem in this scenario. So, I first would like to give you some examples from other applications, what they have done in process and product traceability, not per se in the RFID itself, because actually no other application has RFID for in this sector, as far as I know. And then afterwards, there I give some recommendations in flow and how yeah, so along the way, I will just show you what is available. It's also it's nice to see what the others are doing. So um, some of the basic criteria before I selected were, was, is there a smartphone app? Are they operating in this first section, in this first mile? Do they have track and trace functions, like barcodes, RFID, anything? And if there's an offline availability. So the biggest competitor, so to say, is what they are or what they are really good at is farm course. They are really um, they are working in the horticultural sector in Kenya. They started they are su uh, subsidized by Syngenta, which is a pesticide chemical company of some kind, and they have 
instead we, we are trying to implement the food certified they are working with global gap and very short global gap is a certificate you need to enter the adoption market with your vegetables so it's linked to horticulture again what they are doing better or what they are really good at is uh, they have early warning systems <coughs> text messaging and smartphone tools and they have uh, they are really well um, incorporated into the value chain in the Kenyan sector and they start more quality projects at the moment. But they have uh, what I think Aqua not should per se go into, but what was really interesting about their tool is that they have a, a, a way to measure financial liquidity of farmers because. Uh, yeah, it's hard to explain. <laughs> uh, you have uh, farmers' capital is different from here in the Netherlands compared to small farmers. They have less fixed assets. They depend on their liquidity. Yeah. They really depend on the rotation of their money coming in and going out, and not per se on their fixed capital that they have. So what? Farm force um, automatically calculates is that okay you have this harvest which will revenue this I give you a receipt while on, on the field and then uh, we can calculate immediately with the microfinance institute how much revenue we made and how much and you don't need per se to cash out you can also cash cash out by you uh, buying fertilizers or buying other stuff for your inputs so they have this closed circle financial uh, they really are, well, they well done this because usually a farmer has a problem obtaining his money because a trader needs to bring, bring a big sack of money into the field and then hopefully it's not stolen on the way and then after three months after the harvest they get paid and they actually needed that money because they needed to invest in their field again. So by really closing this system up they really took a good step into the immediate payment. And yeah, that, that's one of their main strong sides, I think. And actually that they have early warning systems, so when some kind of locust or pest is going into their field, they can detect this and then send farms uh, text messages like, watch out because this pesticide is approaching. And they use barcodes, by the way. <laughs> they use barcodes uh, to have their administration and to trace the product. The product. Um, the other tool, which is similar to farm forest, but not as well, uh, not as well integrated, but still quite good. It's called geotraceability. I uh, talked with somebody about geotraceability, but she was not very positive about them because they are sitting on their data. They have the field surveys, which are entered into the system. They have the, the traceability data, with the barcodes, and all the information there into the system. And then here, geotraceability does their magic, <laughs> and it ends up here with a visual platform which you cannot do data drops. So the one person, I don't know the details, but whenever they say they figure out, oh, uh, <laughs> do you mean exporting raw data? Yeah, they don't do that. They really want to sit on this because that's their money making model. And there are more people like this. But this one example. <laughs> this is a profit, uh, profit organization. I think it's, yeah. And, but there are also others like um, really these large scale organizations like the Sustainability Consortium that's uh, really reviewing supply chain from beginning to end. But they are doing specific research for specific uh, clients. But they don't publish this, it's not transparent. It's because they are. Working with this client, they just give the client the information. I must also say that certification information and what is not quality, or if there are problems found in the field, this is not transparent. People from certification standards don't like to communicate this. They don't want to show which farmers have which non conformities. You don't want to know, or you, you just want to have the, the certified logo, but you want to be anonymous if you have child labor in the field and all that they found out, you know. So that's why, in general, certification uh, information is not 
but it's not IATI <laughs> standardized. <laughs> so there is another tool which I particularly like to get into the bright light of the certification standards. Uh, this is a tool which started out in the Netherlands, and they are able to combine different standard uh, surveys from different standards, and they put it in one list. So it's for for a farmer to make it easier for him to fill out all the certification guidelines without repeating himself. Because uh, some coffee farmers might be and wood certified and organic certified, and if they're really well developed, they might have a fair trade because that market would like fair trade. That, that's the craziness of the certification at the moment. And it's to reduce administrative burden. So when they, uh, they have four certification standards. That's Tesco Nurture, it's a private standard. That's another branch, but you have private standard, organic, um, Aquabau standard, Dutch standard, and the global gap. They have all these certification standards. You have to uh, put that into their system. You can select what standards you have, and it will get one question out, so you don't have to repeat yourself. That's quite nice with this tool. It's completely different than what the flow can do, but it's they thought about how can we make this administrative burden, how can we lessen this? Um, the email um, there are also other tools which we focus again on the process itself. Uh, there are tools that focus on specific things, like the Smart Farming app is from two or three VHL students, from co students. They are looking into pest and disease management, so they really focus on this one thing in the in the process. And there are more tools like this that focus on a specific item, like uh, weather reporting, pricing reporting, and the computer is that maybe. Uh, and they took up the Better Cotton Initiative uh, certification. Yeah. Well, sorry. Oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. i have to be quick. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I'm, I'm nearly to the end. Okay. So, <laughs> I'm nearly yeah. Okay, Smart Farming app, yeah, they're awesome. Uh, they have a very basic tool. Hello, everybody. I am recording this extra 15 minutes in order to finish the presentation uh, what wasn't I wasn't able to because my battery was dead and there were some technical hiccups I had a huge version of the the demo effect so that's why I continue like this in an audio with the screen on about the presentation so the last thing I discussed was the Boer and Bunder, uh, the Dutch version of um, the Dutch agricultural website about farmers and their geoshapes, about their geoshape data being displayed on the on the website. The main parts for this website are the crop rotation, some, some specific characteristics of the field. Afterwards you see a whole thing, uh, the triangle about the soil type, if it's clay or sand or any other type. Then you see the growth of the produce itself and the, and the volumes produced and then the height of all the produce collected. I can fairly recommend you to just to have a look at the website. It's really nice to see the visual overview and the different agricultural, specific agricultural indicators that are presented there. If you look, I took a screenshot of it and presented it here in this slide. If you click on a specific geo shape, you can really review the different kind of crops which were cultivated in what year. Next to that you have the hectares, the coordinates, and you can see on the left in the column the, the type of soil, the growth, and the height, the level. Of course, we don't have much in the Netherlands, but it's more the height of the 
of the plants itself and how, how high it has grown. What is so nice about the Boer and Bunder website is if you zoom in enough. Again, what I really like about the Boer and Bunder website is that you can if you zoom in enough, you can visualize each geo shape. And the Netherlands is quite known for having a lot of parcels and having a lot of small shapes available. And the Dutch government decided to make this um, data publicly available by having a nice website about it. And the farmers can fill in their own information online. When we visualize this for the dashboard in Flow, you can imagine clicking on the tab for maps and then you zoom in into, into a specific region and you can review all the farms that are locally indicated with the geo shapes and not by having the data points but really having the shapes visualized in itself. What I would like to give ACFO as a recommendation is to look into specific agricultural indicators because most of the agricultural indicators here you can use this in any other context. It's generic. You can anywhere you can have information about soil or about the growth of your the yields you had or the height of your crops. And this is also quite interesting with regards to caddish fly. If you can combine caddish fly information, for example, on the the newly developed strip test analysis that you can indicate a pH level or a NPK level from your soil nutrients depending on what strip test you have done or water quality or a caddish fly in this sense can be a valuable, a valuable addition to all the other indicators which are currently be used. So for the recommendation in general, flow in itself is, a, is in itself working well for certification. You can create surveys, you can improve some basic improvements on the visualization dashboard can be done. But in itself, it's a very good uh, tool. It can be used anywhere. Um, but for the process, product traceability, it will be a bit harder because there are large distances, it's remote areas, and the structures of the value chains in itself make it quite hard to actually start a product traceability system or an electronic re registration. I mean, you can start with barcodes and RFID, but you really need to review case to case your supply chain in order to see where you can actually do this. and. Also, it's very important to know what what does your partner want? What level of traceability would they like to have before implementing Flow and saying that we can do a lot of technical back-end solutions? We really need to research carefully before you step into uh, the in this sector. And for certification, it will be bad, it will be easily or it would be more easy to start with than with product traceability at this stage. However, Flow is not the only tool at Ocfo, of course. As a general recommendation for company-wide, I'm giving a bit of bold statements here. Um, for Dash, for example, I've mentioned it before in the presentation, if you can combine the geoshape data, which you can export, and layer it over data, for example, about forest fires, which NASA has open data maps for, then you can actually review if your farmers were involved in or were near the fire zones in when there were forest fires in Sulawesi. You can inform your client, on the other hand, if your smallholder farmers are involved or not, and that you are not involved with destroying forests, rainforests. This will be quite a unique concept in this sector. Next to that, I've already touched upon it with the Boer and Bunder website, 
the farmer in his field website. Uh, if you have caddis fly and flow as a combination, you can start doing yield predictions, which is a tool which is very much demanded in, in high demand when it comes to traders and trading to have a accurate yield prediction with regards to numbers of trees, hectares, your soil structure and your soil health, which are already things that caddis fly, some of it can take up so that's not it, it's a really unique tool in that, in that sense the last one is flow and the offline aquapedia it's based on the smart farming app which I showed before that you really try to have some sort of a bottom-up approach with regards to farmers or that you really want to have farmers informing other farmers using digital tools which would be nice to have a kind of a video or to translate the pages for Bahasa Indonesia about rainwater harvesting for cultivation. So these were my main uh, points in this presentation. Um, there was a everybody was kind of pleased Uh, Thomas asked me a question: Why would, um, why would uh, another partner or another person involved prefer Aquo over Aquo Flow? Actually, better than, for example, Farmforce. And I think the strength of Aquo really relies on the fact you can have raw data exports, and that's. Your ACFO is has such an organizational structure with the partnerships that the part data ownership is really of that partner and it's not an ACFO's interest to have any data to sit on the data and to do to work with the data. That's up to the partner. But it also means that ACFO creates a kind of independence which FarmForce does not have. For example, Farmforce is involved with Syngenta and those are the chemical, that's the chemical company investing in Farmforce itself. The Farmforce is better integrated in the chain and working and doing its job, but I think that uh, Aquo has a more wider application for the sector, really looking into certification standards itself really look, focusing on the research part using Caddisfly and focusing on maybe even national or international mapping dependent on what uh, scope you're working with. But I have not heard of any other tool which can like a combination of Caddisfly and Flow where you can have a low budget measurement or yeah, uh, easy accessible measurement tools with regards to doing research. So I think my main recommendation is to stick where to the things that we're good at and figure out along the way how we will tackle product management because the blockchain will be interesting but that's another presentation as I told before. So thank you for listening. It's been an hour. <laughs> I figured 30 minutes fine but my planning is not so good apparently. And I hope if you have any questions, you can always contact me via eline at aqvo.org. And if my email stops working, then um, I have a longer email, but you can always contact me via Skype. So don't worry, drop a line if you have any questions about any of this all. So this was an introduction to the agricultural sector, and hopefully I will see you again. Bye-bye.